Uh, all right, so we're going to start talking. Uh, I'm just going to uh, start talking about chronic hypertension uh, from the emergency department and going to kind of walk through some of the epidemiology and then turn it over to, to uh, our colleagues here for some more information. So, um, sorry, this is taking a life of its own on here. I just showed all my slides. All right. All right, thank you, Joe. Joe's on the organizing committee, so he knows these kind of things. All right, so why focus on the emergency department? These data are a little bit old. Some of you may have seen this before. But the one thing that we know is that most people who come to the emergency department do not have a normal blood pressure. So only about 15% of all comer patients are going to have a normal blood pressure. And most of those patients are going to have a blood pressure that falls into the high category. This graphic, uh, this table was put together before the uh, 2017 hypertension guideline update, which redefined elevated blood pressure as greater than 130 over 80. Uh, and so these categories uh, correspond to the JNC7, not, uh, not the newest uh, uh, categorization. Uh, but if we were to look at it with 130 over 80, we'd see even higher numbers of elevated blood pressure in the emergency department. And we know that the incidence of hypertension-related emergency department visits is increasing. This is some work that Candace and I did uh, a few years ago looking at the NEDS database. And what you see is, a, is an increase in both the uh, number and rate of patients coming in with hypertension as a primary or secondary diagnosis. Now this closely mirrors the ascendance in the number of emergency department visits that we see going from 98 million in the late uh, 1990s to 140 million or so in the last year or two. So we see a rise overall, and as we see a rise overall in emergency department visits, we're going to see a rise in patients with elevated blood pressure. So I'm, I'm happy to say that this was recently published actually in Academic Emergency Medicine yesterday, but this is a graphic uh, showing some work that we've been doing in Detroit for the last uh, two years or so. We've been taking all aggregated blood pressures across uh, a couple health systems in the city, mine uh, at the Detroit Medical Center and Joe's at Henry Ford uh, Health System, and mapping blood pressures out by census tract to get a sense where in the city the hotspots are for uncontrolled hypertension. And what we have here is a map of 552,000 encounters over 26 months uh, and displaying um, color gradation based on the mean blood pressure in the census tract in relation to the AHA cut point of 130 as, a, as the systolic blood pressure. And what you see here is that virtually every census tract in the entire city of Detroit and the outlying suburbs has a mean blood pressure from emergency department measurement that's greater than 130. This graphic includes kids, uh, and it includes a whole range of, of different races and ethnicities, uh, predominantly African-American or black, as you can see at the bottom right there. But the bottom line is if we were to toggle and move this and take out all the children or so, uh, all the, the young adults, everybody less than 20, the entire map would turn bright orange. And what we've been starting to do now is look at ways that we can take this information and use it to design population level interventions, recognizing the emergency department has an important role to play because as I think a lot of us in this room know, sometimes for patients who come to the ER, it's the only chance they're going to have to see a provider and the only chance we're going to have to intervene uh, upon this. And one thing we do know about blood pressures, and again, I'm sorry it's going uh, fast, is that um, the expenditures for health care related to hypertension uh, have been going up a little bit, again, mirroring some of the use of uh, of healthcare overall, but this is the total expenditure for hypertension versus other disorders. You can see it's relatively flat uh, uh, overall, a little bit increasing for outpatient expenditures, decreasing for hospital uh, inpatient expenditures, meaning that we're probably admitting fewer patients for hypertension disorders, but increasing dramatically uh, for hypertension in the emergency department. So it really makes sense to focus on the emergency department predominantly because that's what we're seeing. The patients are there, costs are rising related to this, so we really need to be doing something about this. Paula Tanabe published this literature a few years ago, uh, almost uh, 10 years ago at this point. But basically, this is an important graphic that really counters what a lot of people say when we ever talk about doing chronic hypertension management from the ER. It's just stress, it's just anxiety, they're just in pain, whatever it is. The data basically show that uh, uh, when patients present to the emergency department with elevated blood pressure, if they're followed up on an outpatient basis and you look at standardized scales of stress uh, or pain, uh, anxiety, you don't really see uh, much of a change over time. So it's not stress and anxiety that we can explain away the elevated blood pressure. We also know that people speak with their feet. When they come to the emergency department, a lot of times, at least in the urban environment for patients who have uh, some challenges with access to care and challenges with insurance issues, they're less likely to be coming to the hospital or the emergency department because of an acuity issue and far more likely to be coming to the emergency department for an access-related issue. There's no place else they can go. The doctor's office is not open. It's the usual place that they go to get care. So if this is the place that they're coming, how do we turn our back on an entire population that really needs our help? 
And we know that this affects different races disproportionately. So blacks tend to use the emergency department uh, for ambulatory care conditions, sensitive conditions, more than whites do, right? And that leads to tremendous racial disparities uh, when we know that patients who use the emergency department as their primary portal for hypertension management, uh, it, it, their outcomes are worse because they don't get the care they need. We often don't think about what we're doing. So where's their opportunity? In Detroit and a lot of urban communities, because we ignore blood pressures down at this point, patients are more likely to develop subclinical target organ damage, which makes them more likely to develop cardiovascular disease. When this happens, you get a community that has an early vascular aging trajectory. As you can imagine, looking at that map of Detroit, if the entire city has uncontrolled blood pressure, we have an entire community that's at risk for early vascular aging. We've talked about this, at least in the lay literature, using the term the silent killer. But it's really not so silent. The data are screaming out to us, telling, telling us, do something about this. What are we going to do? And really, in Detroit, what we're trying to do is get at least our population onto an average life course. We, as emergency physicians, typically focus up here. What can we do to get early goal-directed uh, you know, therapy on board for sepsis? At least a few years ago, we would consider that, right? What do we do to get early intervention for heart, fa heart failure, MI, stroke, whatever it is? And the reality is when we do this, we're really playing at the margins because the people that we're going to help here is much smaller than the base over here that we can help before they ever develop these disorders. So I cut my teeth in emergency medicine research doing acute heart failure studies, but then quickly realized that I'd rather never see a heart failure patient again because we've done such a good job controlling hypertension that they don't come into the emergency department. We know that there's a reluctance on the part of emergency providers. These are data from Brig Bauman, multi-center study looking at over uh, almost 1,200 people, looking at what emergency physicians do. The one thing that we know more than anything is we can talk about lifestyle modification, but a lot of these patients are going to require antihypertensives. Very few patients with elevated blood pressure are going to be able to manage it with diet, exercise, smoking cessation alone. But emergency physicians are so reluctant, even when blood pressures are markedly elevated, to do anything about this for the chronic care. We, everyone in this room who's an ER doc, has stuck a 14-gauge needle in someone's neck and not thought twice about it, but God forbid we send someone home with chlorothaladone, right? That's like heresy. And with my residents, when I talk about this, they want to give two weeks of antihypertensive therapy as if that's going to intervene in this patient's life. So when I see these patients in the ER, I give them six months of antihypertensive therapy. It doesn't discourage outpatient follow-up, but at least enforces, uh, reinforces to the patient the need for long-term management. And we've done studies looking at what happens when patients get prescriptions at discharge versus not. And these are in the context of some of our funded clinical trials. And basically, not surprisingly, if you give antihypertensive therapy at a follow-up visit, their blood pressure is going to be lower. So we can do something about it, and we can move the needle. Likewise, we don't do a very good job at all about the other factors that might go into lifestyle modification. That's not really our purview in the emergency department. We've been trying to do some work from the ER around this. Our group has looked at text message-based interventions. Uh, we have an ongoing M, uh, health uh, initiative where we enroll patients in the emergency department with uncontrolled hypertension, randomize them to smartphone-based app support uh, for lifestyle management and, and blood pressure um, uh, antihypertensive therapy compliance. This study is recruiting 400 patients. Uh, we are now almost at the 100 patient randomization point. We've developed a whole app that supports the individuals. It's called MyBP, the Michigan BP Initiative. And then the other one that we don't do a very good job of is directed referral. So oftentimes when we see an elevated blood pressure in the emergency department, we sort of say to the patient, you have a very high risk diagnosis here. You have elevated blood pressure. You have hypertension. Go figure out how to manage this. Any one of us in the room has also tried to make an appointment. And when you try to make an appointment, you get put on hold. You have the person who it seems their job is specifically to not help you get an appointment rather than to facilitate the care that you really need. We are all individuals with social capital and the ability to kind of push the agenda, right? I hurt my knee and I needed an MRI. I can get it done in three days. If you're a poor black person in the city of Detroit and you need an appointment for follow-up in primary care, it may take months to get that appointment. So what can we do from the ER to help this out? We know that of the screening activities that we do in the emergency department, screening and referral for hypertension in a survey of emergency department uh, chairs and chiefs, it's one of the things that people want to do. We want to do this, but how do we do it best? We're doing another project in collaboration with the state of Michigan and Henry Hort, uh, Ford Health System to start called Bring It Down. These are dollars from the CDC through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. They came to me and asked, what can we do about hypertension management, because that's the emphasis of the project. They said, why don't we focus on the emergency department? Why don't we put a project together called Bring It Down, where patients present to the emergency department, they get um, automated EHR prompts that alert a community health worker who then steps in and fills in the gap for the reluctance of what our clinicians don't want to do. So if the clinicians don't want to manage hypertension, let's take it out of their hands, but let's create a pathway that we can get the care that these patients need.
So that's kind of a little bit of an overview of what we can do and hopefully convincing you guys that this at least matters to the degree that more than eight people should be in the room talking about this. But we'll go back and talk to your colleagues about that. We're going to hand this off now uh, to one of my absolute favorite people in the world, Candace McNaughton. And she's going to tell us more about the work she's doing in Vanderbilt. Awesome. All right, here are my uh, disclosures. Um, I'm really excited to talk about hypertension. Um, actually, uh, quick aside, so um, I had a procedure last year and was waking up from propofol, and I woke up to myself talking to the anesthesiologist about his blood pressure and how he needed to titrate up his HCTZ. <laughs> so this is really very near and dear to my heart to the point where apparently that's really on my mind even when I'm sedated. Um, okay, so I'm going to focus on um, medication adherence, which is not something that we talk a lot about in the emergency department, other than to say that we sort of, I think, assume to some degree or another that our patients really aren't taking their medications, partly because it's safest to assume that for the most part. But um, before I focus really down on medication ad adherence, there's a couple of things that I really want to highlight that Phil has already talked about. Um, from uh, a, a large population perspective, um, hypertension is probably one of the most important things that we can address as physicians, um, even in the emergency department. My department chairman, uh, Dr. Slovis, who loves running lights and sirens and uh, loves the flashiness of all of that that's involved, you know, SWAT teams and things like that, he has said on multiple occasions that we're probably going to do more benefit for our patients by addressing uh, blood pressure than we will riding lights and sirens uh, with uh, patients in the back of an ambulance. It's not as sexy. The return on investment is not immediate, but uh, the long-term investment is humongous uh, compared to probably most of what else we do. The problem with a couple of the barriers in terms of addressing blood pressure in the emergency department is it is really easy to ignore. Uh, it's really easy to chalk it up to anxiety. It's really easy to chalk it up to pain. There's actually no evidence to support pain or anxiety being the cause of elevated blood pressure in the emergency department. Um, and because of the new guidelines, uh, the thresholds that we use, most, many, probably more than half of our patients are going to meet criteria uh, for having elevated blood pressure. Um, in terms of another barrier to why we don't address it is that there's a little bit of nuance, right? So we've got patients who come in, they've got significantly elevated blood pressure. Our tendency is to drop their blood pressure in, over the course of a day. The reality is that for most of the patients, if, if they're asymptomatic, we really want to drop it over the course of a couple of weeks. It's not that we don't want to address it at all. It's how do we get it to come down over the course of weeks to months and continue to stay down. So it's a little bit of a frame shift for most of us in the emergency department. Um, Phil has talked about the ED as a missed opportunity. This is some unpublished data that I need to publish. Um, what we have looked at is we followed patients who are in the emergency department who are actually reasonably healthy. If uh, you take somebody who's in the emergency department and their lowest blood pressure is above 140 systolic, the probability of them having a blood pressure in the year following over 140, so a conservative assessment, right, because hypertension is now with a threshold of one, uh, 130, um, they're almost three times as likely to have elevated blood pressure in the year following. So I now clinically look at patients, and because we're in the emergency department and patients tend to be there for a while, I'll let their blood pressure cycle, and I'll go back and look at the trend. And if their systolic never dropped below 140, that to me is a red flag uh, that I didn't used to have in the back of my mind. And if they, um, if the two lowest blood pressures are above 140, then that jumps up to almost seven times uh, more likely that they have uncontrolled blood pressure. Their blood pressure will come down outside of the ED, but it won't come down to normal uh, for many of those patients. I'm sorry, uh, eight times higher. So what this means is we, we really shouldn't ignore elevated blood pressure in the ED. And Clinically, it's really easy to sort of say in your head, if, they, if the lowest blood pressure that I see is above 140, then I need to do something. Now, what that is depends on the patient. One thing to consider if they've been diagnosed with hypertension and their prescribed medication is, are they taking their medications as prescribed? Now, uh, there was a, a reasonable uh, New England Journal article a few years ago about medication adherence, and they talk about the terminology. We don't like to call it compliance because that... Uh, uh, has a, a connotation of, you know, this is an order from the doctor to the patient, but really it should be a relationship. Um, but Everett Koop said that drugs don't work in patients who don't take them, but it really is actually more nuanced than that, because it's not just are you taking your medication, it's the degree to which you're taking the medications as prescribed. If you take your chlorothaladone on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and not on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, your adherence is 50%, but the effect of the drug is not going to be the same if you take it every other day. 
So it's actually really important to sort of really drill down and get a better sense in an open-ended way, how are you taking your medications? Now, our patients, it turns out, are just like everybody else. Uh, they're just a little bit sicker, but they only take about half of their medications. So this is a nice um, graphic that shows that for every 100 prescriptions written, essentially 15 to 20 percent are refilled as prescribed. So there are different components to adherence. Are you taking the medication at the right time, using the right dose, and are you continuing to take it over time? Uh, if you look at how many patients out of 100 prescriptions are taking their medications properly for that one prescription, it's 25 to 30, all medications uh, uh, combined, uh, and it's less than that if you look over time. So um, in terms of patients uh, and, and taking their medications, somewhere between half, uh, it depends on the medication, it turns out. Patients are less likely to take their diuretics than they are their opioids, but on average, patients take about half of their medications and about a third of their antihypertensive medications. Um, things that influence whether or not patients are taking their medications come from a lot of factors and a lot of angles. So here's our patient at the center. Um, this is a, a framework that I've used um, that uh, I borrow from the RAND. Um, uh, there was a RAND report a few years ago about medication adherence. Um, so they put the patient at the center, and in terms of things that influence whether or not the patient's going to take their medications, and so things that we should consider as we're looking at a patient, <clears throat> excuse me, so how they feel about their illness. So patients come into the emergency department frequently and will say things like, I know my blood pressure's high because I've got a headache or I feel dizzy. Um, there actually isn't any evidence that um, elevated blood pressure uh, is associated with a uh, headache necessarily, uh, unless there's end organ damage, um, but it, I use that as an opportunity to intervene. <clears throat> Our patients with dementia, that is sort of a, an area uh, that is ripe for exploration in terms of ways that we can improve uh, getting patients their medications when they can't remember if they've taken them. Uh, patient demographics, as Phil mentioned, um, Socioeconomic status uh, has a huge impact on whether or not patients are able to get their medications or get in uh, to uh, see providers who can take care of them. Coexisting illnesses, so uh, if you've got mental health conditions, uh, those are going to take priority for most patients over their hypertension, uh, for which they primarily may only experience side effects from their medications uh, for blood pressure. Uh, and then medication characteristics. So I mentioned uh, that patients are unlikely to miss their opioids, but more likely to miss their diuretics. So these, uh, where I focus in the emergency department, are things like medication characteristics, uh, illness function, um, oh, I'm sorry, illness representation, and coexisting illnesses. And often where I will start is by asking the patient, uh, and I've got this, I think, in the next slide. Let's see here. Actually, I'm going to come back to that. I'll start by asking the patient in an open-ended fashion, how many days in the last week have you missed your medications? So I start with the assumption that they've missed medication, so there's less judgment. And then I'll sort of say, can you tell me more about that? And I really do leave it in an open-ended fashion. Uh, the success of that is going to vary to patient, by, by patient population, so different regions of the country. And then I change that wording a little bit if I'm at the VA versus Vanderbilt uh, to make it more palatable for the different patient populations. Um, we did some qualitative interviews for patients uh, in clinic as well as patients in the emergency department because the other assumption is that patients in the emergency department are somehow different from our patients who are in clinic, that somehow the patients in the emergency department are, um, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of worse in some ways either. They've got more, more issues that would, different barriers um, and that we'd need different interventions to get them access to their medications or address their adherence issues. And what we found actually is that the facilitators and the barriers to medication adherence are the same in clinic versus the ED, that the patients are sicker, obviously. Um, but as Phil mentioned, a lot of times patients use the emergency department because it's a, it's a source of access to the system. It's not that there's something necessarily different about uh, the types of barriers uh, to adherence. In both clinic and the emergency department, uh, having a routine, having a social or family support. So if uh, several of the patients mentioned um, they had friends who set up uh, voice reminders uh, that you know would chime at a certain time of day and say, you know, Bob, uh, this is your friend so-and-so, I love you, it's time to take your medication. That in both clinic and in the emergency department was noted to be a really good motivator for taking medication. And then easy access to physicians or whoever's providing or prescribing the medication uh, and refilling that, so automated refills for both the ED and uh, clinic are vital uh, 
Um, I think the issue is that the ED just sort of concentrates the patients who have more barriers. This is a graph um, that, uh, again, sort of points to the importance of at least thinking about and asking the question, at least in an open-ended fashion, one sentence, how many days in the last week have you missed your medications? Uh, this, what this shows is that we looked at medication levels in the blood um, among patients who were prescribed three or more medications. And uh, as adherence goes up, blood pressure goes down, even in the emergency department, even in the setting of acute pain, even in the setting of acute anxiety. And so as much as we would like to say that uh, adherence is not our problem, uh, it actually probably has a significant impact um, and is something that we can influence uh, in some small way that can have larger um, uh, effects after the emergency department for all of our patients. So I think, uh, you know, if there's anything that you take away from this uh, small section uh, addressing hypertension and medication adherence is that, one, I want you to think uh, that it is something that we should consider and that we can ask about in an open-ended and non-judgmental fashion in the emergency department. And just asking the question, in the past week, how many doses of this medication have you not been able to take? Uh, a lot of times the floodgates open. And if I follow up with, again, just tell me a little bit more about that, I'll get a lot more information that um, in more times than I care to count has changed my medical management for the patient and it's changed disposition in a lot of uh, cases uh, because what it does is it, it gives me a lot of uh, more information about are they able to go home safely, uh, what kind of follow-up do they have. So um, if you take anything away from what I've said, please take that away. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, it's really important that we think about these problems. Um, and that while we can't fix everything, we got to start somewhere. Um, so I'm going to hand it over. Who's up next? All right. Excellent. Thank you, Candace. Let's see. This is a lapel working. Can you tell? Can you hear deep voices resonating with me, but I'm only a foot away. Okay. Well, I will assume it's not working and turn it off. So bear with me. All right. So uh, Phil had asked me to talk about shared decision making for chronic hypertension in the emergency department. Um, and I just invite you to explore with me the potential implications of this. This is largely a secondary uh, effect of the recent ACCHA guidelines on primary prevention recommending shared decision making be used for management of, uh, of hypertension and to facilitate adherence. And so is there any role for this and as part of this pathway that Phil is describing, could a community health worker be um, equipped with a model to help patients walk through what they should uh, take for their hypertension with that affect ad adherence? Um, I have uh, some of the work I'll be discussing in this has been funded by two different PCORI contracts, but otherwise uh, I don't have any other conflicts of interest to disclose. And uh, rather than just assuming you guys know what shared decision making is, although the, the term makes sense, this is really a way to span the, the data and the science on population level epidemiology and, and to personalize it for your patients. Um, and so it, it takes these population level estimates, uh, generates individual risk uh, level estimates for your patients, and then simultaneously you can explore with them, does this make sense with their own values and preferences and in, in your own care context, um, can you pull this off? So this is a systematic review of the effects of decision aids to facilitate shared decision making across multiple medical specialties. This is a systematic review that's been renewed at least three times by the Cochrane Collaboration, and the most recent iteration has 105 randomized trials and over 31,000 patients. And so we know that if you engage patients in shared decision making using decision aids, you can anticipate that their knowledge will increase, they'll have a more accurate perception of their own risk for adverse outcomes or the effects of the treatments that you're offering them. Uh, they'll, they'll feel more informed about what their options are, about their own disease. The actual treatment choices that will make that are made, as Candace referred to, are more likely to be aligned with the patient's values and preferences. And then finally, you're actually going to increase the patient's participation in the decision-making process, and often in this disengaged uh, patient population that has poor access to care, their, their default is to, to expect you to make the decisions for them, which actually in the end uh, deleteriously impacts uh, adherence. So what is the evidence for shared decision-making in the emergency department? Uh, I've talked about it across all of medicine, and now I'm just going to summarize the results of two trials that our group has uh, recently completed. One was in low-risk chest pain, and in, in this trial, we engaged patients who were being considered for admission for observation, 
uh, in the decision to be admitted for observation or to follow up as an outpatient. And we use this one page, which has now been uh, transferred to a, uh, transformed to a black and white um, uh, handout uh, and grayscale, so that it, uh, we call this uh, affectionately our county hospital version of our decision aid. And the other one was 11 and a half by 17 in color and beautiful. And we essentially let the patients know what their individual risk is for uh, a major adverse cardiac event and walk them through what their options are. And we randomize patients to either, either usual care or, or shared decision making facilitated by use of the decision aid. And you can see similar directions of effect compared to the rest of uh, the, uh, the data that has been published in the literature across all of medicine. Our patients were more knowledgeable about their own risk for ACS. They're more engaged in their care. There was a lower rate of observation needed admission, lower rate of stress testing, and it was shown to be equally safe to usual care. We then took the same model and uh, looked at the question of what about shared decision making in parents of children with minor head trauma and the choice of head CT. And so we uh, developed a decision aid that has been informed by the PCAR and risk criteria for clinically important traumatic brain injury and developed a decision aid with the input of parents who have had experience bringing their kids to the emergency department for this condition. Um, and then walk them through what a concussion is and what it isn't, that we can diagnose that by physical exam, and then what their individual child's risk is for a clinically important brain injury. And then a little more details about what it might be uh, involved if their child was, in, was to undergo a head CT or if they opted to follow their, or their child at home. Here's what you're signing up for. Do you feel comfortable watching for these signs and symptoms? And then finally walking them through the advantages and disadvantages of, of the choice of home observations versus head CT scan. And we recently published this data in the JAMA network um, open uh, in late 2018, and we, we saw similar directions of effect in the uh, parental population. There's a 2% lower head CT rate in the intervention group uh, in the emergency department, although that wasn't significant in our trial, and there was lower seven-day uh, healthcare utilization. And similar to our past, past trial, it was also shown to be safe. So now that we summarized what is shared decision making, what are the effects of decision aids across all of medicine, multiple fields, what, is, what are two of the latest trials that have come in within emergency medicine, let's talk about the possibility of shared decision making in chronic hypertension. And this is more of a, of a thought experiment or an exploration. And as uh, Phil referred to, uh, when I was uh, spent you know, 15 years at Mayo, and like the, the normal mantra was, well, if you've noticed an mm -hmm. elevated blood pressure, you can't definitively diagnose it in the ED, but you do need to document it and ask the patient to follow up and document uh, you know, possible hypertension as one of your diagnoses. Um, and then you're good as long as there's no signs of end organ, end organ damage. Uh, but uh, just last week we had a 44-year-old female um, uh, who ended up with a massive left MCA stroke and the hypertension was her only risk factor. And over the past six months I've taken care of two females that are less than 40 years of age, both of which um, met criteria for a type 2 non-SD segment elevation myocardial infarction from from hypertension. Um, and now that you're, you're, you're in the same situation again, and you see this patient with elevated blood pressure, if you ignore it, they'll probably, there's a reasonable likelihood they'll show up five years later, just like the patient uh, two doors down. So there's definitely more of, a, of an impetus to want to do something about it. Um, this is a, another model for medication adherence, and this is published by the World Health Organization. And I'll just, I'll just highlight the different themes or domains that that really need to be tackled simultaneously if you want your patient to adhere to medication. Um, and so social and economic factors, such as homelessness, as can the patient pay for the medication, uh, condition-related factors, such as the severity of their uh, other diseases and comorbidities, the healthcare system and team factors that we referred to earlier uh, about patient-provider relationships and provider training, which can be uh, directly impacted with shared decision-making, and then therapy-related factors. How complex is it? What are the side effects? And then finally, patients' knowledge and beliefs. And even though they rarely experience symptoms from hypertension, they believe that they actually need to take medication for it. Um, and so if we were to develop and test a shared decision-making intervention that's effective, I would anticipate we would be able to ad address provider knowledge about it. We would be able to bring patients into this uh, decision-making process. A well-designed or developed decision aid would be able to handle the complexity of the choices between medications as well as their side effects and simplify this in a way that patients can understand and when they're making the decision about whether or not they want to start a medication and which one, including how much it costs, how frequently you have to take it, how much it might impact uh, their own um, uh, footprint of medication in their life and how hard it is for them to take these medicines. In addition to their own knowledge and beliefs, um, do they, but at the end of this process, do they really believe they need something for blood pressure or not? 
and, um, and also an opportunity to address concerns. And so I think an approach to management of, of hypertension through uh, medication adherence as one of the interventions among multiple lifestyle modifications really needs to take into account all these factors simultaneously. And so from that perspective, thinking about the outpatient pathway that Phil was talking about, if you have a community health worker, um, would it, in that context, would a community health worker uh, who was trained and equipped with a decision aid make an impact in adherence? And as I alluded to earlier, the latest ACCHA guidelines on the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease highlight um, uh, atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease is the number one modifiable risk factor for primary prevention, and in their own guidelines, they recommend shared decision making with, with sensitivity to the social determinants of health. So they're really trying to deal with the same issue, and if you just go to Google and type in shared decision making tools for hypertension, this AC, uh, ASCVD risk score is embedded um, in an app that you can enter your patient's characteristics, and then you can show them what their 10-year risk of an adverse cardiovascular event would be if they didn't take anything. And in this case, it's a 62-year-old female uh, who's not taking any medication, and 22 people just like her will have a major heart attack or a stroke or possibly death in the next 10 years, and uh, the remaining individuals will not, and three people will just stop medicine because of a side effect or it just doesn't agree with them. And the, when you actually look in the literature for shared decision-making specifically for hypertension, uh, the evidence, just to give you a heads up, is just not good. And it's really kind of it makes you wonder if it's really worth it. Uh, there was a systematic review that was recently published that of, six randomized, uh, of six studies, five of which were RCTs in the European primary care population. And they had uh, various types of uh, shared decision-making interventions, um, including decision aids as well as patient coaching and other interventions. It was a lot of heterogeneity in this systematic review, so the data weren't, weren't pulled, and I don't have any uh, very pretty forest plots to show you. Um, but there, in the end, there wasn't any difference in the blood pressure control between the intervention and control groups at the time of a pre-specified follow-up. And in only one of the studies was there evidence that shared decision-making was actually improved, which to me like brings, really raises the question of was the interventions really effective? Have effective interventions been developed and tested adequately in hypertension? I think that's an, an, unknown, um, an unknown question, uh, the answer to it. And so I, I, what I've done here is I've extracted one of the studies that I thought was pretty interesting. And what this was an observational study, and they applied what's called the control preference scale, and that's the blue line that you see. And they found that patients, when they classified their preferences for involvement in decision making as passive, active, or shared, and active being they want to be in control of it themselves, and they would just want a little bit of assistance from the physician for information, and shared is really this combined approach to decision making, that the rate of adherence w reflects the patient's preference for involvement in decision making. But then this is in a primary care study, and they were asking the question, is it really worth it if you developed a good relationship with your patient? And the, the line on the top, the red line, indicates those are patients who have had a relationship with their primary care doctor for over a year. And you, you can see that if you have a good relationship with your primary care doctor alone, that can impact adherence. But when you ask the same question in our setting, which we have like maybe five, maybe six minutes to talk to patients, we don't have like years to develop you know, relationships, uh, we may get a different answer. And, and so, you know, when you're considering uh, in, intervening in this patient to really try to make a difference and maybe try to change their narrative, if their, their uncle may have died young from hypertension, um, is this something that they can, can impact? Um, the questions might be, like, do you understand your own personal risk for a major adverse cardiac event and you think you can do anything about it? Do you want to start treatment now, later? If I give you a follow-up appointment, will you actually follow up? What's holding you back? Uh, you know, questions about do you, are you afraid they might charge you more when you show up at your visit? Do you need a ride uh, to make it there? Um, and this is an opportunity for community health workers and, and uh, medical social workers and case managers as well. I think that we're on next. Hey, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Is there? All right, we just got a few more minutes. So I'm just going to quickly discuss some opportunities and thoughts that uh, myself, Phil, and others have have been working on in relation to popula population health and health disparities, particularly in the area of hypertension. And I do want to save some, a few minutes for, for questions, so this will be pretty fast. Um, we already kind of covered, Phil already covered how, you know, if you look at, at heart disease, cardiovascular disease, is really, there's huge disparities uh, in, on a population health, um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, African Americans versus other races. 
And so Phil mentioned how, you know, we've been working on, on mapping of blood pressure across uh, regions of southeast Michigan and that, uh, and that we're currently working on a project in which we will take patients with uncontrolled hypertension, link them with navigators, and then uh, bring them linked to primary care where they can get management through pharmacists and through primary care. With that too, though, is opportunities to improve um, how primary care, but then also f other physicians within healthcare system can actually assess that patient's cardiovascular risk, their blood pressure, and actually make management decisions. So, you know, currently, if you're a primary care physician or an emergency physician that's trying to deal with this, you have very little time to actually assess uh, a patient adequately. You know, you have, you know, 15 patients scheduled in the next two hours, or you have a recess going on uh, next door. And so, one thing we've been working on is, is visual overlay uh, with the EHR. So integrating data in the EHR in a way that physicians can actually use it quickly and accurately uh, to trend both blood pressure, but also to trend ASCVD or cardiovascular risk scoring. To really get a, a, a full picture that may capture more than just that clinic's blood pressure data, but capture blood pressure data from all sources that are available in the EHR so that you can't make the assumption, oh, this is just one aberrant blood pressure value. No, here's a graph of how the blood pressure has been uncontrolled for the last year and also something that the patients can access. So we're currently working on implementing this within our health system and creating these, these type of dashboards. These are beta versions that have been designed. Now with this too, it's hard to read from the top, but also using publicly available data sets to integrate social determinant of health information into that. So clinicians, clinicians can have an idea of what social determinants based on geography the patient may have. Do they live in a food desert where they don't have access to uh, non-processed foods that may be impacting their hypertension, et cetera? And so currently we're, we're working with an organization called the Michigan Health Information Network, which is essentially a, 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 a health information exchange in the region. And many other cities have similar, similar regions or even at the state level have similar information exchanges where a lot of this data can be captured and then merged with social determinant of health information and then process, process in a way where you can display that data reliably to clinicians and then also potentially overlay that at a community level. And so Phil's currently ma mapping that same social determinant of health information onto the hypertension mapping so you can see where social determinants of health are having the biggest impact on uncontrolled hypertension in a community. And so I do want to make sure we have some time for questions. So why don't we go ahead and start with that. And uh, if you can go to the mic, that's great, but no need. I can always repeat the questions. Can we, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so my name is Tyler Winters. I'm from the Medical University of South Carolina. And first, thank you for your talks. Um, and it's, it's funny how the world gets a lot smaller in the world of emergency medicine, high blood pressure research, hypertension research. And I think that um, even, you know, so even within our respective institutions, it can be hard to get traction with our colleagues and whatnot to pay attention to these numbers. We don't have time or whatever the excuse is. And so it sounds like you guys are doing really innovative things at your respective institutions, but on a bigger level, um, in the community and other hospitals, outlying hospitals, et cetera, um, what do you envision being the future of uh, ensuring that there is good secondary and primary prevention out of the emergency departments? Do you, do you envision policy interventions or perhaps reimbursement interventions? And, and just kind of my question is what kind of work's being done on that and, and where you see that going? So it's a great question, and thanks for asking it. I think, first of all, um, like politics, all solutions are local, right? So it's what's going to work best within your system, but there needs to be reimbursement. So one of the things that we're pushing for with the whole community health worker idea is how do you get billable codes in place that would affect the reimbursement. So there are codes for community health workers to do linkage to care activities, to do screening tests, and to do education. So if you can get that linked up for hypertension, and advocate at the state level for those things to get put through. That's huge. So we're working with our state government in Michigan to push that forth. But what we need to do is have some evidence to suggest that the community health workers will actually benefit 
uh, the patients. And so that's why we're trying to track all this data in aggregate and pull it in uh, to be able to display that by doing a project like Bring It Down, we've actually decreased blood pressure at the community level, at the clinic level by tracking it with the dashboard, but then to, to say at the community level, which will then lead to better outcomes, so we want to scale up community health workers across multiple uh, different departments. I think that's one way to look at it, but there are other systematic things. I don't know if there's anything you guys are doing at the VA or Um, so I work at the VA. The, the VA is a little bit of a different system. The nice thing about the VA is that uh, cost is cost and billing is less of an issue because it's all built in. And so what I do is I just include the primary care provider in my note, or I, we've got a pharmacist in the ED, and I can have them come back. And it's less the VA uh, emergency departments are not viewed as like a separate thing where the goal is to avoid the ED. It's just an adverse outcome. Uh, it's more viewed as a, just an extra way to access the system, and so we sort of accept that role, and we roll with it. Um, on the civilian side, we're still working on doing the community health worker approach uh, in Nashville. Um, uh, I, it, I think, like so many things in life, you know, if I hear uh, it's going to take just a few more clicks, uh, one more time, then I'm going to you know, start hurting people, or if I hear, you know, you just do this one more thing, um, and so and I, I think that is where um, empowering other folks outside of just the physicians uh, is going to be really key. And as Phil mentioned, who that's going to be in your healthcare system may be a little bit different. I don't know. Are you working with anybody in particular? Which city are you in, Ken? So I'm in Charleston at the moment. Um, I did residency in Cincinnati and okay. so worked with uh, those guys. It sounds like we know a lot of people in common. Awesome. Uh, uh, there's a fair amount of work in, well, and here's the problem, right? We've got the silo where cardiology is doing all this work on resistant hypertension, and a lot of their patients end up in the ED, and then they have no idea who we are. So there are a fair number of folks in Charleston, and then, um, oh, what's the other city in South Carolina? Anyway, but I think sort of reaching outside of the emergency department is where to start. So. I'd just be curious, Eric, you know, you're at UAB. That's been like a mecca for all things hypertension research. How systematic are approaches there to act as well? Um, I have, honestly, I don't know. I've only been there about a year, and I'm still putting it all together and meeting different players. I haven't seen a lot bleed over into the emergency department. Uh, we do see just mainly the adverse effects of it. Um, they forget about us, I feel like, unless we like stick our hands up. Yes. Yeah. We're here. What's a little crazy is this grant funding that we have from the CDC, uh, 18 states got funded for this, including obviously Michigan, and we were the only state with a program that focused on emergency departments. So when I went and presented this to the CDC, people were blown away. In fact, the representatives from the uh, uh, Department of Health from Alabama came up to me afterwards and said, this is great, how do we move things forward? And so we got Eric linked up with them now, and we're trying to kind of grow this idea. But I think the bigger narrative is do we, as our specialty, take ownership over our role in the continuum of healthcare, or do we continue to be focused on episodic interventions when people come and appear at our door? And I think that's the biggest philosophical challenge that we have. We've gotten a lot of pushback. Everyone on this panel has gotten a lot of pushback over the years trying to promote things that are not seen as the purview of our specialty. And um, the purview of our specialty is saving lives. Doesn't matter if we save the life today or 10 years from now, we're still in the same business. And so how do you get people to reframe that mindset? So not to promote my own junk here, but I encourage you to look at academic emergency medicine at an article called Whose Job Is It Anyway, uh, which is a commentary and editorial that I just had in there, really kind of discussing this idea because we often hear people say it's not my job to take care of chronic hypertension, but it's really all of our jobs. Because everybody who says it's not my job leads to the person who comes in five years from now with a stroke because five years ago nobody said anything. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a research opportunity too for developing tools of how to, how to move the needle in terms of emergency providers and their attitudes for this. There's lots, lots to do there. Yeah, one of the things we really were hoping out of this panel, obviously we don't have a, a lot of critical mass here, is, is there a group of, of sites, places in emergency medicine that really want to do this work? And it sounds like Charleston uh, may certainly be one of those. Uh, and Terry, Terry has his Michigan roots, so we can talk to him about that. So, but uh, you know, I, I think that's that's really the thing: is how do we how do we move this forward? And I can tell you, when we first started writing grants, the comments that would come back are: ER patients are a bunch of drug abusers. They're not the real patients that we want. They're not really what's going on. But the reality is that's America, and people come to us. And we have to figure out what we're going to do and not, not define these artificial challenges.
Yeah, so I think certainly if, if you or you know of colleagues that are interested in, in you know, potentially creating a, a more formal network uh, to dig into a lot of these, these issues nationwide, um, please do contact us and, and, and we, we would love to collaborate. Hi, my name is Susan Hammerman. I am a uh, clinical researcher over at the University of Colorado, and I'm, I'm actually applying medical school. Um, my question is uh, twofold. One is uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, your uh, objectives to uh, send patients home with, uh, say, six months of uh, uh, therapy rather than two months. Uh, rather than two weeks. And so one question is what kind of follow-up is is done with these patients during that six-month period? Uh, and uh, are they just sent home with prescriptions? Uh, is there a follow-up to uh, uh, try to uh, encourage them to have a PCP uh, certainly no later than the end of that six-month period to have an ongoing relationship since you've got this dilemma as to uh, what is the role and whose job is it. Uh, yeah. So what we find in, in Detroit, at least my health system, yeah. Joe can speak to some work that we're doing within his health system and maybe you guys can talk too, it's very hard to get follow-up appointments with a clinician. So what we've started doing was uh, is creating pathways for pharmacists and collaborative practice agreements to follow these patients. So we have a, a pharmacist who presented some of this research at ASEP last year. We've created an open access pharmacy run clinic where patients don't even need an appointment. They can just show up and the pharmacist will facilitate their care. Um, again, collaborative practice agreements with my license that they're managing the hypertension. So I, I think it gets back to the point of just creative solutions. But I can tell you, because we do so much longitudinal follow-up of our patients in research projects, we've never seen somebody come back necessarily with a dangerously low blood pressure after getting started on an antihypertensive therapy. One of the things that we did early on, and others have worked on this, is trying to quantify what is the effect of an antihypertensive medication. Because then it makes it a little bit more comfortable for us to send someone home. So a fully dosed antihypertensive medication uh, gets you about a 15 to 16 millimeter of mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure. And two gets you 30, three gets you 45. I mean, that's just the way the numbers have worked out. And they're additive. It's not like you get diminished effects with, with multiple medications. So I think we've worked a lot and published articles on this idea of clinical inertia and how do you move people out of the way. Well, someone comes in 160 and you send them home on 10 of them lodipine, they're not gonna bottom their blood pressure out. They should get follow-up to see what else they might need done but in the interim period, to avoid what like Candace was describing, if we don't do anything today, a year from now, they are going to have persistent elevated blood pressure, and they're gonna be the ones who develop the consequences. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a risk benefit of leaving uncontrolled blood pressure with uncertainty around that follow-up versus starting antihypertensive therapy and pushing somebody towards a pathway where they recognize this needs to be something they do for the rest of their lives. So I don't know if that directly answers the question, but that, that to me is always the balance point. Right, trying to just teach the residents that two weeks is going to do nothing. It takes at least a month to get the blood pressure under control anyway. And then you're better off keeping them on that. And amlodipine is a safe agent because you're not going to develop electrolyte abnormalities. You're not going to develop renal issues. And for the vast majority of patients, it's probably the right answer uh, for first line therapy. And, and actually, that was uh, uh, my second question was regarding the uh, disparity between uh, what's being taught in residency and and uh, clinic and what is uh, best practices. One would hope that they would, the two would be intertwined and married, but I'm hearing two weeks is in the impression that many are under, and, and uh, yet there's this uh, uh, view that six months, and especially since the medication doesn't even kick in within, within two weeks. Why yeah. is two weeks still being viewed as a standard? Yeah, what, what we hear, I don't know what you guys think, we hear that, um, Emergency physicians don't want to encourage continued use of the emergency department for this purpose. Mm -hmm. So if we make it easy for them, then they'll keep coming back. So let's make it a little harder for them. Yeah. And that's yeah. really... But if they weren't seeing a PCP regularly before they arrive, what, what's going to change? Right. What's the magic right. that's going to happen yeah. with them? Yeah. So maybe you can talk a little bit about, Joe, what we've been designing. Because I think it, 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 it has to be holistic, right? It has to be a system. It can't be anything in isolation. Yeah, so I mean, I think designing ways, you know, we're working on with designing ways in which you know, these patients are, are linked in a way such that there's 
everyone has adequate data about what's going on, but then also there are both both pharmacists that can manage. There could be nurse-driven protocols where, where there's reliable nurses that will follow them, and then having having um, you know appropriate caseworker work like we've been, like we've been talking. So. Yeah, but this gets to I think Eric's point. When you have someone who's reluctant to do something, how does shared decision making or how could it be impactful to change their mindset? What do you direct that towards? Yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on how that might look? I mean, you've got to bring it down, I think, to the individual patient level and, and equipping, I think, other community workers to do that um, and really not burdening the emergency physicians in, in our approach to doing so is critical. I think as we really try to tackle these public health issues, uh, coming up with alternative models is, is really important. Um, there is another instrument for, for back pain that a friend of mine, uh, Tim Platts Mills, has developed, which is a, an educational interactive video, and it's, it's combined with a a telecare follow-up with a nurse at 48 hours for patients with, with, with chronic back pain. Um, and so there's starting to be, what, you know, evidence of models that develop that can be used by other workers that I think will help them and really equip them in walking through these issues with patients that otherwise they probably feel like, uh, I don't know how to compare these two medications really well and I don't, I don't know how to answer these questions and then ask the, the doctor to take care of it. But. Oh, we have one minute. I just wanted to ask Candace something because Candace taught me something when we were first starting to work together that compliance and adherence are not the same thing. <laughs> so maybe you can kind of address that a little bit within this context because I think you hit the nail on the head. It's, patients don't want to be bad patients, right? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the things that I learned in the qualitative interviews and, and just the longer I do this, the more I realize people are in general doing the best that they can. And so meeting them where they are at. Uh, and recognizing that and then validating that really uh, has been helpful uh, at, the, at the bedside. So, um, so sometimes it's not just they can't get their medications, they don't know what to do with them when they have them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's too much chaos in their lives and, and, and it's, it falls off the, the table, which I understand. So. Yes, Wes, lactated ringers, lactated ringers. <laughs> Norma Saul, it's fine. Um, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago that the paradigm, I think, in acute care medicine, both like medical school through training was long-term medicines were not prescribed in settings of urgent care and EDs. Do you think that's finally changing, and how can we speed that process? I mean, I think the role of the emergency department is changing, uh, whether we want it to or not, because the healthcare system is changing. Um, uh, from a, in order to speed that up, I think it's gonna take a systems change. Uh, there's only so much we as individuals can haul up a, a mountain, so to speak, uh, is sometimes it, I feel we can be a little bit like Sisyphus, you know, you're like sort of pushing this boulder up a mountain by yourself. Um, but I think, so what Phil has done, uh, uh, going into leadership and, and going outside of emergency medicine has been a great model for me to follow, and we need more of that, I think. So. I, I actually, I mean, I think we have to start in medical school. In yeah. nursing okay. school, yes, this right? Is true I mean, as well. I mean right training? So, yes. some, I feel like the nursing even is blown away when we, yeah. some of these concepts of chronic That's illness care and emergency point. departments, urgent care centers. So I think there's still a long way to go. You guys are doing a great job, but I mean, even further upstream. Mm -hmm. so, so, Wes, at, at Wayne State, they have a, um, a shared practice uh, curriculum that all the medical students have to do. And we've been designing a curriculum component that would include a triad of a, a medical student, a nursing student, and a pharmacy student to go out there and do uh, blood pressure screenings and get involved in some of the community health centers that we have in the area to, to get this idea. I mean, it, to me, everyone in medical school, no matter what specialty you go in, should be trained in how to manage chronic hypertension. I have RAs that can manage hypertension better than half the docs that I know, right? They'll come and say, patients here, just do this. It's just an algorithm. But you know, you go to your dentist and your blood pressure is high, they send you the ER. You go to your orthopedist and your blood pressure is high, they send you the ER. Every one of these docs was great in medical school and they could easily figure out how to write a prescription for an antihypertensive medication. But we've sort of abdicated this role to a subspecialty, which is really not a subspecialty all of medicine, which is family yeah. medicine or internal medicine. This has to be everyone in medicine takes this on. You know, we didn't show the data here, but with the new guidelines, in the black community, 60% upwards of population is going to have hypertension. When three out of every, you know, when, when uh, what's that, the three out of every five people is going to have a condition, that's mm -hmm. not something that anybody can focus on. That's something that everyone needs to pay attention to. Cool. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.